How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good evening, my friends, and welcome to another evening of Millennium of Prophecy. My name is John Lomaking, and I am so excited that you have chosen to join us again this evening. You know, we have just started this seminar. We have just scratched the surface, and the best is yet to come. I heard a story about a little boy who was reading a bedtime story late at night, and his dad kept walking by his room, hearing his son say, if you only knew what I knew, if you only knew what I knew. And he wondered, it is so late, he should be sleeping by now. So he rapped on his door and said, son, what do you mean if you only knew what I knew? And he said, dad, I've been reading a story about a bad bank robber going from town to town, robbing banks and throwing the deputy sheriff in jail. But at the end of the book, a deputy sheriff won and put the bad guy in jail. And then I went back to the bad guy and said to him, if you only knew what I knew, if you only knew what I knew. See, friends, the bad guy was going from one place to the next, thinking that his reign would never end, but finally it did. And friends, when he knew the end of the story, it was a good story to him. And friends, we have not yet gotten to the end of the story, so stay with us as we continue night to night here at Millennium of Prophecy. Before we go any further, however, I'd like to invite our audience to join me as we bow our heads this evening, inviting God's presence to be with us. Let us bow. Gracious Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for your wonderful word that is as a light shining brighter and brighter as we see its words unfolding in our day. We pray that you'll give us stamina to come out night by night to enjoy this excursion through the scriptures. Direct us as we open the word and help our understanding to grow. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, I'd like all of you to join me now as we welcome our speaker for the evening once again, Doug Batchelor. Thank you, John. Very happy to see each of you here tonight. I want to welcome our Manhattan audience and thank you for returning. And wanted to especially remind you, remember this weekend, the uh, first Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're giving you the keys to unlock prophecy. Tonight we're going to be looking at a lesson that deals very specifically with signs that tell us about the eminence of the Lord's return. But this is one of my favorite parts of our study time together, where we do a little interactive Bible question and uh, answer time together. Here she comes. Are you ready? Yes. We're really excited because we are starting to receive information from our sites around the world. You know, we have over 5,400 different downlink sites around the world that we're, we're airing to, and you are all participating in, and it's really exciting. And to we see. got a few questions from around the country and the world as well as we here in the did. hall. Thank you for responding. I asked you to send questions. We received email. We received faxes. We also received questions locally. Are you ready now? We'll see. Okay. In your first program, you did not mention the Empire Kingdom of China. How does China figure in Daniel's interpretation? That's from James here locally. Okay. You remember when we talked about the metal image of Daniel chapter 2, and we outlined these prominent world empires. Let's see if you remember. What was the head of gold? First one. Babylon. Babylon. And then the silver arms represented what two kingdoms? Medo-Persia. And then the belly and thighs were bronze, and it was Greece. Greece. Legs were iron, and they represented? The feet were iron and clay, and they were what? The ten divisions, the toes, you might say, of the Roman Empire. And a lot of people have asked me, well, Doug, that's pretty 
arrogant for the Bible to say it's just Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. What about the great empire of China and the great Aztec and Mayan and, uh, and uh, Inca empires in the Americas? And what about uh, the Indus empires in India? And there was a lot of great civilizations. Why does it just mention these four? Very simple, friends. These four kingdoms had a direct influence on God's people. Babylon occupied the promised land. Medo-Persia occupied the promised land. Greece, Rome occupied the promised land. So these nations were mentioned because of their direct influence on those that had the oracles of God. Well, God wasn't saying they were the only civilizations. All right. John 14, 6 says, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What about millions of people that don't follow Jesus? Are they doomed? Well, she read the scripture, no man, John 14, 6, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Does that mean everybody who has not claimed Christianity is automatically lost? No. How do I know that? Jesus began his ministry by going into his home church of Nazareth. And he stood up and he preached and he said, there were many widows in the lands, in the land, in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up and there was a famine for three and a half years, but Elijah was not sent to stay with any of the Hebrew widows, but he went to stay with a Gentile. And then he goes on and says, there were many lepers in the land in the days of Elisha, who is a different prophet, but none of them were healed except the Syrian Naaman. Christ was emphasizing that God answers the prayers and works with people and tries to save and cares about people from all over the world. See, the reason that God gives the truth to his people, and I believe his people, especially in the Old Testament, were the Jews, and today I think it's spiritual Israel or the church, is that they might share salvation and the truth with the world, not to keep it to themselves. But the Lord judges people, Christ said, based upon the light that they've received. Jesus said, if you did not see, you would have no sin. But now that you see, your sin remains. He goes on to say, the servant that knew his master's will and did not do it will be beaten with many stripes, because he knew and he did not do it. But he that did not know and did not perform his master's will is beaten with few stripes. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 says, if we continue to sin willfully after we have a knowledge of the truth. See the difference? God judges us based upon what do we know. That means he looks on the heart. The Bible says man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on what? The heart. He looks on the heart. And so will there be people saved who maybe did not know about Jesus? Of course there will. But they're being saved by virtue of his sacrifice. Nobody gets to heaven except through Christ. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to get there. And I remember one time we were driving somewhere. We came up to the toll booth. And when we went to pay the toll, they said, go on through. We said, what? They said, the people in the car ahead of you recognized you. They paid it for you. We don't know who paid it for us, but somebody paid it for us, and we were sure glad we could go through. Christ is the one who's paid the price for anybody who's saved. You understand that? Amen. But there'll be some people maybe who never heard about him, but they lived up to the light that they had. Our next question comes from Benjamin from the Bronx. Why is God's Spirit called the Holy Ghost? Do we believe in ghosts? That used to bother me, too, talking to the Spirit as though it was a ghost. It made me think about Casper or something like that. But uh, no, it's just an old English word, and this is maybe hard for our translators to, to uh, translate, but uh, there are something that we call ghosts, but they're not departed spirits. The Bible tells us, and this is in our next lesson, about fallen angels that haunt, they're called demons, fallen angels that haunt and torment and manipulate and spook people, okay? But they don't wear white sheets and flutter around. That's all just uh, fairy tales and fables. Uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, the word ghost and spirit there, they mean the same thing. It means the holy pneuma. The word pneuma is a Greek word for the holy breath of God, the spirit of God. It's where we get the word pneuma, pneumatic tools. Pneumonia was supposed to be a problem with breathing. It was the breath of life. It's the spirit of God. It's okay. just another word for the same thing. Okay. Who is the Ancient of Days mentioned in Daniel 7, verse 9? Okay. You've got the verse, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, speaks about this great judgment. 
and someone's wondering, who is this Ancient of Days? And it describes this being who is glowing, who sits as the great judge of the universe. It's God the Father, we believe. And the reason for that, if you keep on reading in Daniel 7, it says, one like unto the Son of Man came and presents himself before the Ancient of Days. Now, who is the Son of Man? How did Jesus refer to himself throughout the New Testament? as the Son of Man. And he's coming to intercede. Who is the advocate, the intercessor, biblically? It's Christ. He is coming before the Father, the Ancient of Days, we believe, would be the Father in Daniel chapter 7. Our lesson tonight is one of the most important in the series. It's called the Coming King. And we're going to begin, as we do, with a historical that helps us to segue into our study. Dealing with a young king, Joash, and how he came to the throne. It begins with a coup, a military coup. There was a very aggressive general by the name of Jehu. You ever heard the expression, someone says, he drove like Jehu. The uh, Bible says evidently he drove his chariot furiously. And in one day he overthrew and he assassinated the kings of Israel and Judea. Well, when that happened, the mother of Ahaziah, the king of Judea, when she found out her son was dead, she was so jealous for power, she did not want one of her grandchildren to be coronated in her place, did something very ruthless. It's almost unimaginable. She executed all of her grandchildren. You know, I used to believe one of the strongest earthly emotions was that love of a mother for her baby. Uh, the older I get, I find out that the love of a grandparent is pretty strong too. This lady, <laughs> this lady was very sick. You know who her mother was? You ever heard of Jezebel? The wicked queen of the northern kingdom. So she had a good teacher. And she killed all of the royal seed. She sent her soldiers before anyone could disobey her personal bodyguards in and had them butcher all of her son's children, her grandchildren. One of them managed to escape. The aunt of Joash and um, the nurse managed to take the little baby, he was one year old, and hide him in the temple of the Lord, where they kept him secured for seven years. That's a long time to go to church, isn't it? He was there actually six years. He stayed, he ended up being seven years old when he came out. Six years in the temple of the Lord, the high priest Jehoiada, who lived to be about 130 years of age, tutored him personally in how to be a good king. And from the word of God, Finally, the time arrived when young Joash was about uh, seven years old. They decided it was time to uh, present him to the people. They couldn't keep him hidden forever. And the, uh, they got the soldiers. They notified them. They brought out the king's son, King David's heir, and they showed him to the people. And they said, set the soldiers about him, guard him. They blew the trumpets, and they anointed him as king there in the temple of the Lord. He came out while Athaliah heard all the noise and she heard all the ruckus. And uh, she came in and Jehoiada said, seize her, take her out, and execute her. The people rejoiced. The trumpets blew. Joash was surrounded with his armies and he received his kingdom. She had ruled over the land six years. When he was seven years old, he took control of the kingdom. Now, that's a very important number that's going to appear. You know, the Bible tells us that our high priest is Jesus and that he is in the heavenly temple right now. And soon he is coming out. He's at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly temple. He is soon coming out of that temple, and the Bible says he's going to receive a kingdom. You read in Revelation that when he comes, he is going to execute the mother of harlots and all the false religious systems of the world that have opposed him when he comes, that's the Athaliah, so to speak, that you find in the book of Revelation, and her daughters, the Jezebel and her daughters, and he will take the kingdom. Now, friends, I'm going to share with you something called the 7,000-year theory. And this may take a few moments to explain, but once you capture this, you've been wanting to know something about the eminence of Jesus coming, and this is going to give you that information. Here, let me peel out a few extra notes that I had. I told you the birth of Christ was about 2004 B.C., right? 
Creation, when you add up the ages in the Bible, I'm not going by the evolutionists and what they come up with. I'm saying if you just take the Bible in your hands and you start adding up the ages, it'll tell you Adam lived so long and he had Seth and Seth lived so many years and he had Enos. And it gives you the chronology and you can add all that up and get an idea of how old the earth is. It's often referred to as Bishop Usher's chronology. He was one of the first ones to do a very precise analysis of this. When you add up the ages in the Bible... It puts creation at approximately 4004 B.C. Now, if you've heard that date before, let me see your hands. I want some support here that I'm not the only one that's heard that date. It's just called Bishop Usher's Chronology. It's not any one denomination. It's accepted by most Bible scholars as a rough estimate for the time of creation. 2,000 years later, 2004 B.C., Abraham was born. You've got 2,000 years from the creation to Abraham. Then you've got 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ. And what time was Jesus born approximately? 4 B.C. Now, we don't know the exact date of his birth. I will tell you it was not December 25th. Don't get mad at me. But uh, we've got a lot of biblical, biblical support for that. You write down a question or you fax one in and I'll give you the biblical evidence that Jesus was not born the 25th of December. Then we've got reason to believe that it's 2,000 years from Christ's first coming to his second coming. He came quietly the first time as a humble sacrifice, as our Savior. He's not coming quietly the next time. Now, this is called the 7,000-year theory. The reason for that is when you get to Revelation, it speaks of a 1,000 years when God's people live and reign with Christ. Do you see a pattern here? 2,000 years, God preaches the gospel through what we would call the patriarchs. See, we got a little chart up here. 2,000 years, the age of Adam, the fathers, the patriarchs, from 4,004 B.C. to about 2,004 B.C. Then you've got the age of the Jews, the Israelites. Abraham was born 2,004 B.C., and you've got that age until 4 B.C. Christ is born, and that would reach to approximately 1997, 1996. And some of you are saying, well, it seems like he's late. Stay with me. Then you've got, the Bible says there's a thousand years where we live and reign with Christ, a thousand years of rest. One thing I want to make exceedingly clear, Pastor Doug does not believe that anyone should be setting a date for the second coming of Christ. The Bible warns us against that. If I were you, I would avoid anybody who thinks they can pinpoint the day and the hour. Jesus does not want us to make our decisions to serve him based on a train schedule. It needs to be a heart commitment. But he does want us to know when the time is near. Now, there's a pattern that you see many times in the Bible. First of all, you've got 6,000 years here, then 1,000 years during the millennium. Some of you are saying, wait, Doug, uh, if we're exact about the year 4004 B.C., and it's not exact. We don't know. There's still some ambiguities in the chronology. Let me give you an example. The Bible says Noah lived 500 years, and he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth, his three sons. It doesn't tell us when they were born in Noah's life. So there's a few years there we're not exactly sure of. So we can't put our finger on the date of creation, okay? Something else that you need to keep in mind is the Bible teaches very clearly that there is going to be an apparent delay just before Jesus comes back. How many of you remember the story in the Bible where Moses went up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments? Do you remember that? How, how long was he on the mountain? 40 days, right, and 40 nights. How long did he wait at the foot of the mountain before he went up? See, everyone knows the 40 days and 40 nights, but if you turn in your Bibles, you'll find out Moses waited at the base of the mountain six days. At the beginning of the seventh day, God called him up into the clouds. Is this starting to sound familiar? And Moses said to the people, I'm coming back, but he didn't tell them exactly when he was coming back. When he did come back, it says in Exodus when the people saw that Moses delayed, delayed coming down, we're, we're, we thought he was coming back, where'd he go? It's been so long. They lost heart, they made a golden calf, they broke all Ten Commandments in one wild party. But then he came. There was an apparent delay, but then he came. Jesus says in Matthew 24, if that evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, and begins to eat and drink with the, the lost and the drunken and live like the world, the master of that servant will come in a day he's not looking for him. He won't be ready. Some of you remember a parable in the Bible of the ten virgins. 
It says, when the bridegroom, that's talking about the coming of the Lord, while he tarried, they all went to sleep. Friends, I'll tell you, if there was ever a time in the history of the world when the church was snoring, you can hear it now. We're living in this era of delay. You can also read the prophecy in Habakkuk where it says, though it appears to tarry, it will come. We're living in that window now, is my, my belief, friends. Right on the very threshold, the Lord is between inhaling and exhaling, and the next main event in the prophetic schedule is the coming of the Lord. Now, there's a few things left to happen we'll cover in future lessons. But there's a pattern here. Now, let me give you some stories in the Bible. There was a law among the Jews that they were to farm their land for six years. The seventh year, they were to leave it fallow to help the soil to recover its virility. How many of you remember reading that? Six years, you farm it. Then the seventh year, it's dormant. You know, Jesus said, I'm the sower. The word of God is the seed. For 6,000 years now, through the patriarchs and through the Hebrews and through spiritual Israel and the church, the seed of truth has been sown in the world. You know how Jesus is pictured coming in Revelation? With a sickle to harvest the earth. And then for 1,000 years, there's no more farming going on. There was another law that they had among the Jews that a Hebrew could have a servant among the Hebrews for six years. What happened at the end of six years? He was liberated. He was set free. How many of you remember the story? I told you about the Mount of Transfiguration. I think it was opening night where Jesus said to his apostles, some of you are standing here who will not, Mark chapter 9, read the whole first nine verses. Some of you are standing here who will not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. After Jesus makes that statement, it says in the Bible, six days later, he took them up. Isn't that interesting? Matthew and Mark. Luke, who got it secondhand, he says about eight days later, because Luke was, you know, just uh, speculating. Matthew and Mark say distinctly six days later, he took them up. And what happened there? He was in the clouds. He was glorified as he will be when he comes. They were given a miniature picture of the second coming. I don't think we need to miss the point that the number six keeps appearing. When you read in Revelation about seven trumpets blowing, right? And after the seventh trumpet blows, Jesus comes and God's people are liberated. Joshua blew seven trumpets after they marched around. How many times did they march around the city of Jericho? Thirteen times. People always say seven times. They marched around the city one time for six days. Then on the seventh day, they marched again seven times. That's a total of 13, right? That adds up for one of, the 12 tri one of each of the 12 tribes and the tribe of Levi, in case you didn't realize that. And then they took possession of the promised land. Well, soon we're going to take possession of the promised land. The trumpets are going to blow. And all these patterns in the Bible are telling us that there could be some credibility to the 7,000-year theory, friends. You wanted to know about the millennium of prophecy? I think we are entering that time. Does any man know the day or the hour? No, but there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that tell us about this pattern. Six days you work, one day you rest. 6,000 years now. Oh, incidentally, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Psalm 84, verse 10, thousand years in his sight are as a day when it is past. And you've got uh, Psalms 90 also. There's several verses that say, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. For 6,000 years, Jesus has been working to redeem this world. The Bible says that during the millennium, it's a time of peace where we live and reign with the Lord. It's like a thousand-year Sabbath, you might say. The pattern is all through the Bible, friends. We are right now at the sundown of that last millennium. Don't pay attention to the year 2000 because the ADBC dating method, it's, it's not accurate. The Bible did not utilize that. But we do have signs, and we're going to cover some of those in our lesson. Question number one, who is the king who will emerge from the heavenly temple? Answer, and remember, you're supposed to say the answers with me. Revelation 14, 4, and I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown. You wanted to know who the Son of Man was there in Daniel 7. Well, right there in Revelation, it tells us Jesus, and he's coming to harvest the earth. One like the Son of Man is coming. Now, we're going to spend the next few questions talking about not when Jesus is coming, 
but how Jesus is coming. And some of you are going to go, I don't want to know how he's coming, I want to know when. Friends, you need to know how. Let me tell you why. When Christ comes again, it's called the second coming. You know what that means? There was a first coming. When he came, when the Messiah, when God became a man 2,000 years ago to show us how to love each other, to show us the Father, to die as our sacrifice, that was his first coming. His own people, my people, had the scriptures. They had the prophecies about the Messiah and his coming. But did the majority of his people recognize him when he came the first time, or did they misunderstand the prophecies about his first coming so they were not prepared? Is there a chance that God's people with Bibles, with scriptures, could misunderstand the prophecies about his second coming? I'm going to promise you that the majority of the world will not be prepared because the Bible says so. Indeed, the majority of the church will not be prepared because we want it to happen a certain way, and if it doesn't fit in with our ideas, we don't accept it. We've got to find out what the Bible teaches, what the prophecies teach. Do you agree? So it's important to know how he's coming. Now, that's one reason. So you're ready when he does come. The other reason is the Bible tells us that Satan is going to par perform his masterpiece of deception. God came to earth in the form of man to save. The devil is arguing with the Almighty. He says, I need to have the right to come in the form of a man to share my viewpoints. The devil is going to come as his great crescendo performance and impersonate Jesus. And if you don't know how Jesus is coming, not just when, but how he's coming is even more important, you will be deceived. Because the Bible tells us that he will perform signs and wonders that will be so persuasive, so convincing that if it's possible, it will deceive even the very elect. That's why we've got to be rooted in the rock of his word or we will be washed away when the storm comes. So let's find out how Christ is coming. Question number two, will Jesus come quietly when he returns? No. The answer says, for the Lord, and this 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Trumpet was the loudest thing they had back then, that uh, man made noise, a shout and a trumpet. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 30, the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a, a shout. Amen. Talking about roar, shout, trumpet. That's not all. Psalms 50, verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. It shall be very tempestuous. That means stormy round about him. Now, maybe I should pause right here before I offend anybody, make a little disclaimer, little statement. I have preached in literally hundreds of different churches with many different denominations, and I am pretty well acquainted with what the different beliefs are out there. One of my favorite things is I like to surf religious broadcasts Sunday morning on the TV or on the radio and listen to what's being taught out there. So I have a pretty good feel. And again, I want to restate, I believe God has spirit-filled people in many different churches, many different persuasions, people that love him that he loves, okay? And he's working in their lives. That doesn't mean I agree with all the teachings. There is a very popular teaching that I don't think is biblical that when the Lord comes that the rapture is going to be silent and secret. I don't find that in the Bible. Stay with me now and see what you find. If you disagree with me, let's be agreeable about it. Does that sound fair? We're here as friends to study the Word. And if you have a question, say, wait, 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 what about this scripture, Doug? Write it down. I am not afraid. I promise I'll read any of these relevant questions and we will address them, okay? Does that sound fair enough? Do we agree to go by what the Bible says? Okay. Number three, what other physical evidence will accompany Jesus' return? It says, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Revelation 16, 18. Now, is it just me, or have you noticed that earthquakes seem to be in the news a lot lately? Like this week, where I used to live up in the cave in Palm Springs, the rocks were shaking. Seven, there's a big earthquake. I live in California. I felt the earth shake before. I was on the telephone with a friend one time, and I had a basketball sitting up on the kitchen counter. And while I was on the phone, I started feeling seasick. I said, I feel something wrong with me. I feel dizzy. 
And then I noticed the basketball was seasick too. It was rolling around up on the counter. And I realized my whole house was moving. And I said to the person on the phone, I said, we're having an earthquake. How about you? <laughs> and he was several hundred miles away. He said, no, we're doing just fine. Another time I was at a campground, a Christian campground, Northern California. And the, I was giving a Bible study to somebody. I had my Bible open in my hand, and I was actually pleading with someone regarding a point of biblical truth. Pretty soon the ground began to move. I felt it rolling like waves underneath my feet. And there was a bunch of these travel trailers, and I could see all the cars bouncing in the parking lot, and the kids were playing volleyball. These teenagers all started screaming. I tell you, it really made it unnerved me a little bit. But you know what? I had a peace. I thought, Lord, if I'm going to go, I'm so glad I'm giving a Bible study right now. <laughs> I gave me, I want to be doing that when Jesus comes. <laughs> but do you realize that there have been five major earthquakes in the last two months over seven? Now the U.S. Geological Survey says we're not having any more major earthquakes than we normally have. The problem is now they're in populated places. Well, now if you are the Lord and you are trying to get mankind's attention, that's where you'd put them, right? You wouldn't put the earthquakes out in the middle of the ocean or, you know, in the North Pole. You'd put them where it would get people's attention. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 24, that is one of the signs of the last days. He said there will be earthquakes in diverse places. And people say, there have always been earthquakes. There were before Christ. It says it in the Old Testament. Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars and plagues and earthquakes and natural disasters. But keep in mind, Christ, when he said that, he's talking about a confluence in a concentration of these things, a greater intensity. Now, I, I read a statistic that said that between 19, 1900 and 1960, there was typically one major earthquake every 10 years. From 1960 to the present, there are now between 8 and 10 major earthquakes every year. Does that sound like an increase to you? It does to me and the natural disasters. Well, I'll get to that in just a minute. And so a mighty earthquake is another sign of the event. Number four, question number four. Who will see Jesus when he returns? Just a few people? You know, some churches say he came quietly already, and nobody saw it. Only special people with special glasses saw him come. It's not what the Bible teaches. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. That great glory means brilliance. It's going to be something that nobody is going to miss. Go on here, and we'll read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he comes with the clouds, and how many? Every eye will see him. Now, somebody always asks me this question. I'm going to get it in advance. Doug, it's a round world. The world's round. How can every eye see him at the same time? It doesn't say at the same time. It says every eye will see him. And as the Lord sweeps around the circle of the earth and he vacuums up those that are ready, everybody's going to see him. And he'll take them back to glory, okay? It doesn't say they all see him simultaneously. Unless, of course, CNN has their cameras trained on the event when it takes place, and then maybe everyone will see it at the same time through satellite. Number five. Who will be with Jesus when he returns in the clouds? Is he coming back alone? No. Matthew 25, verse 31 tells us, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the... How many? Holy. No, how many of them? All. all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory. Now think about this, friends. When Christ rose from the dead, one angel came and rolled away the stone, and the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew the glory, the brilliance, the charisma of that one angel made a hundred of the bravest Roman soldiers fall down in shock like dead men. And then they revived their senses and fled in terror from the presence. One angel. You know how many angels there are? Well, you've heard of guardian angels. How many people in the world now? They say more than six billion now. And uh, we believe the Lord's got at least two good angels for every one evil angel. So let's say 12 billion. That's a conservative estimate. Can you imagine what it would be like if 12 billion angels filled the heavens? You think someone's going to say, hey, did you see the angels come yesterday? <laughs> no, it's not going not to be like that. 
all the holy angels. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, one angel of the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians and 185,000 soldiers were executed in one night from one angel. Number six, what will the brightness of Jesus' coming do to the living wicked? Answer, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Now I want to pause right here for a second. The Bible says Christ left in the clouds and he's coming in the clouds. Those clouds, my friends, are not clouds of H2O vapor. They are clouds of angels. Light. The Bible says when he ascended to heaven, he was received up in these clouds, and it's clouds of light of angels. You need some proof text. You go to Revelation chapter 20, and it says, The wicked cover the earth like a cloud. The Old Testament writers and the New Testament writers sometimes talked of a crowd of people or a crowd of something as a cloud. And so the Lord was received up into these clouds of light, and they were angels. He's coming in clouds of angels. He's not coming in water clouds, okay? Second part of this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and say the answer with me, and shall destroy with the what? The brightness of his coming. That's why, friends, you need to have your heavenly sunglasses ready on your heart, or you will not be able to endure the brightness of his coming. It's going to be brighter than anything that uh, we can explain. Question number seven. What will happen to the righteous who are dead at the second coming of Jesus? Now, biblically, there are two kinds of dead people, the saved and the lost, okay? Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. The Bible says the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice. They that have done good, the resurrection of life. They that have done evil, resurrection of damnation. The Bible speaks of two separate resurrections. Who is in the first resurrection? First Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 tells us, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, wherever you've got the number first, it's a sequential number. Somewhere you've got what? The second. If you want to know when the second resurrection is, you jump to Revelation chapter 20. It says, blessed is the one who's part of the first resurrection. The rest of the dead, who would that be? If the dead in Christ and the righteous rise first, who are the rest of the dead? The lost, the wicked. It says the rest of the dead do not live until the thousand years are finished. So that's the second resurrection. You want to make sure that you're in the first resurrection. Am I right? Number eight. At this point, what happens to the living in resurrected saints? Answer. The dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Those of us who are alive and remain, and I believe there are many of you here who will not die of old age. You know what I'm saying? They won't die. There's going to be a time of trouble and some may die. And there's going to be some persecution. We'll talk about that. But I think that we are living in the generation that will witness the second coming. Do you realize that many of us, some who are here, some who are watching, you have the privilege of doing what Enoch and Elijah did, of being translated without ever tasting death, of dropping off this mortal carnal body and putting on your glorious eternal body? Won't that be nice? Be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and God is going to do that in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We'll be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and then this mortal will put on immortality. Right now, we've got these mortal suits that we're wearing. Number nine, after being changed, what happens to the righteous? Those that are alive, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's what the rapture means. We are caught up together with them, the resurrected saints, in the cloud. See, friends, when Jesus comes and the dead in Christ rise, we're going to go to heaven together in a grand, glorious procession. You know, there's all these comics and cartoons about Peter guarding the gates, and he's got his computer, and he checks people in one at a time like a hotel clerk. You know, that's not the picture in the Bible. The picture in the Bible is a grand, glorious, brilliant procession where we together go back to that city of God. Amen. That's going to be wonderful, friends. Number 10. Now, I want to spend a little time on this because it's often misunderstood. What solemn warning does Jesus give about his second coming? Answer, Matthew 24, verse 5. 
For many shall come in my name. Now, does he say a few? Many means many. Many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Few is the minority. Many is the majority. That tells us the majority will be deceived. Now, notice it says, they'll come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. That scripture can be understood two different ways. First of all, there are a lot of religious leaders that come in the name of Jesus. They say, I come representing Jesus. They're not saying they are Jesus. They come in his name, but then they deceive people. You got that? So that's one way you've got these false representatives. Then, of course, you've got the kooks who say, I am Jesus, right? And, you know, and it's really sad. Uh, this is Jim Jones, of course, who started out. He used to go to church, and, and uh, he was involved with the Methodist church, which is a good church preached and and uh but then something happened and he started wanting to branch out on his own and and pretty soon he got away from the bible i baptized the young lady that was in guyana she left just before the congressman came down and they all committed suicide and they killed the congressman i went to the place where he had his office you know we're from northern california the people's temple in redwood city a tragedy hundreds of people believed he was the messiah they killed themselves this girl that i baptized she said the Lord saved her just in the nick of time from that situation. He started out, we all trusted him. He read the Bible. She said by the time they got down to South America, the Bible was in the outhouse, and they used the pages. Well, I'll leave it to your imagination. He had to get the Bible away from the people. He said it's the old book because he knew the Bible was exposing him as a false Christ. And that's one thing that often happens with these false teachers. They start out claiming to use the Bible to get believers, and then they... they uh, wean the people away, away from the Word of God and say, you now trust me, I have fresh information. The Bible's the old letter. Friends, I tell you, the Word of God does not change. A lot of false Christ. Matthew 24, 24, and verse 26, for there shall arise, say it, false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Now, if somebody appears claiming to be Jesus, and they look like Jesus, and they're very nice, and they quote the Bible, and they're doing signs and wonders and miracles, how are you going to know that it's not Jesus? I'll tell you one very simple litmus test you can apply. The Bible tells us when the Lord comes back next time, his feet don't touch the ground. We are caught up to meet him. So any character walking around on this terrain saying, I'm Jesus, you, be, you need to watch out for. If they manage to come with 10,000 times 10,000 angels, then you would think that maybe this is Jesus, right? But if they're coming down again next time, he said, I already came down on your level. Next time you're coming up to my level, right? He came down to us once. He said, next time we go up to where he is. He came quietly. Next time he's not coming like a lamb, he's coming like a lion, right? So if somebody's walking around saying, yes, I'm Jesus. Oh, and incidentally, I met one once. <laughs> now, I told you I used to live up in a cave. And later this week, I'll give you the whole story of my testimony. I've got some pictures you'll enjoy. Right after I read my Bible up in the cave and I accepted Jesus, I was a baby Christian. I had a lot of things mixed up. I did not know the Bible like I know it today. I knew a little bit because, you know, all I did up there was read the Bible. I lived like a hermit for a year and a half. And uh, one day into my cave yard, such as it was, this gentleman came hiking. I used to run into hikers every now and then. And he had you know, green eyes and shoulder-length chestnut hair, beard, mustache, uh, olive skin. He was about six feet tall and hi, hello, how are you? He came and he sat down to catch his breath a little bit and introduced himself to me. He said his name was uh, Michael David Harper. And he said, that's my earthly name but I, in fact, am Jesus. Well, that really sent my emotions spinning because, first of all, I thought, I'm up here in the mountains alone with this lunatic. <laughs> Secondly, I thought, well, he does kind of look like the pictures I've seen. If it is Jesus, I don't want to insult him and call him a nut. That'd be the worst thing in the world you could do, right? And so, you know, I'm just being honest. These are the things that were going through the mind. I thought, and if he is Jesus, I've got a lot of questions. But my first question was, I said, well, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but uh, the Bible says that you're coming with the angels and there's going to be a shout and it's going to be, he said, that's when I come generally for everybody. 
He says, but I'm coming quietly for certain select few first. The guy knew his Bible, you know, and he was quoting scripture back to me. And, and at first, it really had me unnerved. But after he stayed with me for about three days and ate all my food and didn't help clean up at all, <laughs> I knew Jesus wouldn't do that. Eventually, I had to evict Jesus from my cave. He was really a slob, too. And then I ran into him in town, and he had managed to find an apostle. There was this tall, skinny hippie following him down the streets in Palm Springs saying, this is Jesus. He found a believer. I felt much more relieved a few days later when I saw him again, and he was missing one of his teeth because he got drunk and got into a fight, and they knocked one of his teeth out. And I knew, I knew that Jesus has all his teeth, right? We all know that. And so then I knew it couldn't be Christ. But those aren't the ones that worry me. The ones that worry me is when Satan and his representatives impersonate Christ because it will be very convincing, and it says they will do great signs and wonders so that if it's possible, the very elect might be deceived. But what's going to keep us from being deceived? Coming to this seminar. Finding out what the Bible really says. When, did I miss the second part of uh, number 10? Okay, let's get Matthew 24. Inasmuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. If they say unto you, Behold, he's in secret chambers, believe it not. You know, we had... David Koresh and Jim Jones and the leader here of Heaven's Gate, they were waiting for a comet to stop and pick them all up, and they drank a lethal potion, and they even got the group in, another group in Canada and Switzerland, these cults, and I'll tell you, friends, there's no shortage of uh, deranged and dangerous religions out there. Am I right? Jesus makes sense. His religion will save you, not kill you. He came to keep you alive. He wants you to use your head. He does not want you to follow blindly. Are you aware of that? That's why we're operating this seminar this way. God says in Isaiah, come now, let us reason together. God gave you a brain. He wants you to think for yourself. I don't want anybody following me. I am already intimidated that my kids are starting to act like me. That frightens me. I don't need any disciples following me. I'll be grateful if I can make disciples for Christ. Amen? Amen. And so I want to point you to God and to his word. Number 11, what will prevent the righteous from being deceived? What's going to keep us straight? Isaiah 8, verse 20, according to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to the Bible, this word, this is the law and the prophets, the law and the testimony, the new and the old testaments, the word of God, that's how we're going to measure whether or not they are genuine or counterfeit. And incidentally, you know, of course, that if you're going to make a counterfeit bill, you don't make a four and a half dollar bill. You're not going to pass that off. To be counterfeit, you want it to resemble the genuine as closely as possible. Satan has been preparing his final act for 6,000 years now, and don't underestimate him. That's why you are going to have to go by the Word of God and not by your senses, not by what you hear, not by what you feel. So many people say, oh, but it feels so good. If what you feel is in conflict with what the Word of God teaches, what are you going to follow? The Word of God is the only safe thing. When Jesus was in the wilderness, hungry, and the devil said, you can turn these stones, and the stones probably looked like loaves of bread out there on the sand, you can turn them into bread. He felt like doing it. But he didn't go with his feelings. He said, it is written. You know how this world got into the mess we're in? Because when Eve looked at the forbidden fruit, she said it, it smelled good. It was desirable. And it appealed to her. But God said in his word, do not eat it. She went by her feelings and her senses rather than the word of God. And that's how we all got into this mess. Number 12. Would it be safe to even just go see a false Christ? If he's meeting at a stadium somewhere someday and you say, well, I'm not going to believe, I just want to check it out. Is that safe? You're venturing on enchanted ground when you do that, and it is very dangerous. Don't try to engage the devil. It says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 26, Therefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. You do not even want to go and look. It's not safe. Number 13, what can we know about the time of Jesus' return? 
Answer, Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. Anytime somebody comes up to you and they say, look, I've got it all calculated. There's a radio preacher and several others have tried to pinpoint it and they experience massive embarrassment. Don't try and pinpoint a day or hour because no man knows that. But can we know when it's imminent, when it's close? Yes. Matthew 24, verse 33, Jesus tells us, When ye therefore shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Can we know when it's close? Yes. Is it going to be a secret? No. And that brings us to our next question. Number 14. Soon there's going to be a trip the Lord is going to make through the galaxies. There's a heavenly preparation being made right now. And all the world is going to know when it happens. And our question number 14. What will the angels do at Jesus' second coming? Matthew 24, verse 31. His angels shall gather together his elect from one end of heaven to the other. He's got his people all around the world. Do you see that? Isn't that what it's saying? From the four corners of the earth. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this before we, we move on. There is going to be a time of trouble before the Lord comes back. There's been a lot of speculation. Does this great tribulation take place before the second coming? Does the second coming take place in the middle of the great tribulation? Or does the second coming take place after the great tribulation? And there are a lot of good Christians that believe what they call pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. These are churchy words they use to describe when is the tribulation in relation to the second coming. I believe very clearly that the Bible teaches that the tribulation takes place before the Lord comes. A lot of dear people think that what's going to happen is that uh, they'll be walking down the streets or w driving a car or flying a plane and bingo, they're going to all disappear and uh, life's going to go on here on earth and then the tribulation comes. But the Bible tells us that God saves his people not from tribulation, but through tribulation. Let me give you some examples. When the seven last plagues come in Revelation, it's an echo of what happened to the children of Israel in the Old Testament when the ten plagues fell on the Egyptians. Were the children of Israel in Egypt when the plagues fell? Yes. Did God save them through the plagues? Yes. Did God save Job from his trials or through his trials? Did God save Daniel from the lion's den, or did he save him through that experience? Did God save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, the fiery furnace? Did he save them from that? Or did they go into it, and he went through it with them, right? Amen. God saves his people through tribulation. Paul in the New Testament says in the book of Acts, it is through tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. This idea that the Lord is going to take us away before the going gets tough is not biblical because the church is the light of the world. We will shine the brightest when the world is in the most abject darkness. He's not taking us out. The Bible says you will be hated of all nations, Matthew 24, for my name's sake. Jesus said, he that endures unto the end. Endures what? There's going to be a great tribulation. That's why he says you've got to build on a rock because the storm is coming so your house doesn't fall down. He doesn't say it's a mobile home. He's going to take you away before the storm comes. We're going to be here for the tribulation. Now, a lot of very dear people believe that after the rapture, life goes on here on earth for another seven years because Jesus is coming as a thief. People are going to say, he came and we missed it. Open your Bibles. I've been quoting scripture, but I'm going to turn you now to 2 Peter chapter 3, I think we'll start with verse 10. Uh, we're going to talk about how the Lord comes as a thief. 2 Peter chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which... Now, some people stop right there. He's coming as a thief, Doug, and that means that it's going to be a big surprise. Nobody's going to know, and life will go on the next day. You tell me if it looks like life goes on as normal after Jesus comes as a thief. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we be in all holy conversation and godliness, right? Looking for the day of God whereon the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Does it sound like life as usual after Jesus comes? No, friends. I think the idea that the rapture takes place and then life goes on is a very dangerous belief because some people think they've got another seven years during the tribulation to get their act together. That is a dangerous doctrine. And incidentally, I'm believing the safe thing. I'm going to brace myself for the tribulation before Jesus comes. If I'm wrong, I'm still ready. But there's a lot of people, as Peter says, who are going to be amazed at the fiery trials that try their faith as though some strange thing happened unto them. They're going to go, what's this? We thought that he loved us too much to let us suffer, that he was going to take us out of the world. Did the apostles of Jesus suffer tribulation? I'd like to tell you otherwise, friends, it's a very fanciful, appealing doctrine to say that he's going to take you away. But the Bible says he's coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle. And you know you get the spots and you get the wrinkles out with an iron, cold iron or a hot one. And you can hot water to, oh, Karen's reminding me, you get blood out with cold water. But the other spots you get out with hot water. And that's how we get the clothes clean. Number 15. Since we are living just before Jesus' second coming, how should we relate to this solemn and glorious event? Answer, Matthew 24, verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes. You know, friends, I like that word be. God said, let there be light, and there was light. When God says be anything, that means he gives you the power to do what he's saying. When he says be ready, you ought to be very happy. He said be ready. That means he can help you be ready. When God said to the leper, be cleansed, he was cleansed. And so when the Lord is telling us to be holy, you can be holy. When he says, be ready, you can be ready. Because most of the world will not be ready. They're going to wait until it hits them as an overwhelming surprise. Number 16, how will people be rewarded at Jesus' second coming? Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, wait a second, Pastor Doug. I thought we were saved by grace through faith. We are saved by grace. But the Bible's very clear that your behavior is in the judgment. We are judged by our works. Your works demonstrate whether your heart has been saved, whether you've been changed. If a person says, Lord, Lord, and they don't listen to him, Jesus said they're liars. And so they'll be rewarded according to their works. Number 17. What will the wicked say when Jesus returns? Now, this is a long one, so stay with me. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? I'm glad that the Lord is going to give us the power to stand through that time. Number 18, what will the righteous say when Jesus appears? Isaiah 25, verse 9, they'll say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he might, he could, he may, he will save us. That's good news. And we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Number 19, what is the prime reason that Jesus is coming the second time? He's coming to get even with those who persecuted him, to teach them a lesson. What does the Bible say? Some people think that God's vindictive that way. Answer, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. He's coming to receive us. Now, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. You know, the language the Lord is using there is the language of a wedding. Back in Bible times when the groom proposed and the lady accepted, he went back to his father's house and he built a honeymoon chamber. And you think that after he built the honeymoon chamber, he stands there and he stares at it and he says, now, I know I built this and I can't remember what for. I'm supposed to pick somebody up. Who is it? 
He says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many honeymoon chambers. You think he's going to forget the bride, the church, his people? Yes. No. Did he come the first time like he promised? Yes. That was 2,000 years ago. I trust he's going to come again just like he promised. And I want to be ready, friends. I want to live forever, don't you? Yes. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. How about you? I want to get out of this world and go to a place where there's no more sin or suffering or sorrow. And it's not a fable, it's real. God has a real paradise. It's amazing to me. We got all these people who believe in Star Trek. They don't believe that God can make a city, right? What's the matter with us? Do you want to be ready for that day? The main reason is for Him to come back for you, and I hope that it's your desire to be ready. You know, something very interesting happened a few years ago that I thought was a moving experience. How many of you remember the story where Captain Scott O'Grady was shot down over enemy territory in Bosnia? He felt his plane ripped in two by a missile, and as he was tumbling down to the ground, he remembered that bright lever between his legs. He pulled the eject button, and he exploded out into the sky, burnt his face in the back of his neck, and he parachuted down into enemy territory, where for six days... He ran and hid under bushes and groveled like a scared bunny as and the Bosnians knew they shot him down and they were looking for his parachute and they sometimes walked within a few feet of him. And he was afraid to breathe and he covered his face with mud so that he could hide his wife's face and he had nothing to eat. He was eating ants and bugs and trying to catch a few raindrops. Some people don't know that there was a lot of praying that went on both for him and by him. Well, even a secular magazine included in Time when I prayed for rain, God gave me rain. One time I prayed, Lord, let me at least have someone know I'm alive and maybe come rescue me. And guess what? That night, Tio, which was the name of one of his fellow officers, came up on the radio right after he prayed. At that moment, O'Grady knew his ordeal was coming to an end, that God was going to rescue him. What he didn't know was the preparations that were being made behind the scenes. You see, friends, he was wondering, do they know I'm alive? Are they going to come for me? Do they care? And while he was thinking those thoughts, the whole United States military had been mobilized for the sake of rescuing one soldier wandering six days in enemy territory. They had 40 airships in the air. They were using satellites. They were getting the help of other military from other nations. And he was wondering, will they come for me? And they executed a flawless rescue plan. They put their lives on the line. And they sent that whole army to come and to save that one soldier, all for one. Some people think, maybe God's forgot about us. Oh, don't you believe it, friends? His army is making preparation even now to come and to rescue you. This planet has been kidnapped. God's people are living in enemy territory, but he's not forgotten about us. He is coming. He is coming soon. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know that it is soon, and he wants us to be ready. John, I want you to sing the first verse of that song. appearing yet signs all foretell that the moment is nearing when he shall return it's a promise most cheering but we know made a promise, friends. He said, I will come again. There is nothing, nothing more important being, than being ready for the climax of the greatest event 
in all the cosmos, sin and suffering will be eternally dealt with. Jesus is coming for those who believe in him, who are ready. No matter what your past has been, he can get you ready. Friends, don't forget, the Lord brought you to this program. When's our next meeting? Tuesday, we're going to talk about why is there sin and suffering? And how long is that going to last? And when is it coming to an end? And where the devil came from? And answer so many of these questions. Don't forget, friends, keep us in your prayers. God bless you. If you want to be ready, stand with me as we close with prayer, and I'll say good night to our international audience.